Welcome to the Killer Boobies Podcast, Unraveling Breast Implant Illness. Here's your hosts, Wendy Bunnell, Leslie Smoot, and Brandy Vega. Welcome to the Killer Boobies Podcast. I am really honored for this episode today to be the host that is in the room with Tamara Day, who is, well, let's just call it what it is. She's kind of a big deal. She's only, well, I don't know, I guess if you call 1.3 million followers a big deal. And I believe the reason why people gravitate to you, Tamara, is that you're incredibly beautiful, but you're also standing up for that inner beauty, really helping women to see that they are magnificent just the way that they are. And so with that being said, thank you so much <laughs> for being here. Thank you. Today. That was oh, such a great intro. I could just stop right there. That <laughs> pretty much summed up what I just hope to achieve every day with this platform is that I just want women to see our truest potential. And if I have to be the one to walk that, that walk to showcase it, then I, you know, swear that I will do it day in and day out. So thank you for seeing that and recognizing that. In me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so just share with us a little bit about you. We see the wonderful pictures of you. In fact, I'm like, dang, girl, <laughs> look at that booty. I, I'm seriously going, oh my word. And I know you work out really hard to get that body. Okay. So I respect that. <laughs> Um, and I mean, I'm almost 50 exactly. and a little flat back there, but now that my health is coming back, yes. girl, I am going to be in the gym as soon as my body allows me to. And that's, that's the key. Nice as soon as your body allows you to, you know, I gave, I don't think a lot of people know because when I launched the kind of documentary, mm -hmm. if you will, of the story of, of me getting them out, I was already three, I was already two and a half months post-surgery. So mm -hmm. I gave myself tons of time before I even, you know, stepped foot back in a gym. Although I could have, you know, my, my body, I was so incredibly blessed at my recovery. Um, I woke up from surgery and knock on all the wood in the room have not been sick one day since I woke up from surgery. And I mean, sick with the, all the stuff I had before the respiratory infections, bronchitis, pneumonia, sinus infections, all that. So, that was the biggest blessing. It was more so understanding that the mentality behind forcing yourself to get into the gym and do that work, I was just burnt out. I had done it for so many years. And this was the first time I was put on my back to be like, you need to take care of yourself right now. And that doesn't mean yes. keeping your butt in shape, keeping your, like it, none of it mattered. For the first time I was able to just reflect and um, introspect and do the the deep work that I had been wanting to really dive into, but too afraid to take a second off would throw the whole thing off course, you know, the, all I'd worked for. And God was like, nope, you're going to sit it out. Just <laughs> stay well, right here. Leave because I mean, you've was. grown up in LA, born and raised in LA, in that center of that culture that really, really admires beauty, physical beauty. Mm -hmm. and, and has this unattainable, you know, platform where yeah. most of us are, you know, we, we want to look beautiful. We want to feel beautiful as women. And, and so you were born and raised in that culture. Right. And so here's an opportunity for you to step back from that for just a minute. And what a beautiful- I don't even think I realized how much it had ingrained in me. You know, like I think people see it when they move to LA to try to do something or be something in, in the industry. Right. But because I was surrounded by it constantly, my clients, I own a spray tanning business for 17 years now, my clients are in the industry. I'm always seeing this, you know, really they are quite beautiful people. Um, but always feeling like I don't quite fit into that lane. And I did always want to get into acting and, um, I was told constantly, like, I didn't have the body for it. I was muscular, compact, kind of boyish, if you will. And I didn't have the skin for it. I grew up with severe acne and psoriasis. So I already didn't know how to put my best face forward, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I just knew how to work hard and play sports. So I drove myself into that. And then, of course, when the opportunity comes to do a bodybuilding show, and then I switch from that mentality that's used to seeing beautiful women over here, my competitive side goes, okay, well, all these winners have these fake boobs. 
So it wasn't even that I saw it in like the media and thought I need to have breasts. That was like, I, I wish I was taller. I wish I was skinnier. I wish I had more beautiful skin, bigger eyes, you know, all the things that I thought would make me applicable for that industry. But then I, when I pivoted to bodybuilding, it's like the norm to see these like balloons on top of a very lean muscular frame. And although it wasn't my ideal aesthetic, I thought competitively, if I want to make it to the top, this is what I'm going to need to do. And I was working hard and I had the money for it. And of course we don't, at the time we weren't told how unsafe they were. And so I, and I come from a very, you know, medical background family that they weren't so happy I was doing it, but I don't, even doctors weren't aware or most didn't know the true ramifications of putting them in your body. Um, and so that, you know, you go in blindly, you go in with the idea that Absolutely. I'm going to become the best version of myself through this. And whether that be someone who's um, just had kids and just wants to feel more like themselves or someone on the other spectrum, like me, who was like, I'm going to take it to the top with this sport thinking the aesthetic was what was going to do it. And, and that started me on this entire journey of unraveling the societal norms that had been ingrained in me from a young age. I just didn't know it was going to look like this to unravel it, but it's a oh, beautiful sister. journey. <laughs> you and me both. I mean, if you would have told me last year at this time, Wendy, you're going to talk a lot about boobies in about six All the months. Time. I would have <laughs> What the heck? That's I mean, the I, last thing I want to talk about. <laughs> and and at that point, I was I was hardly getting out of bed. So mm -hmm. for for me to even know that I could be back functioning every single day, having wow. conversations with beautiful women like you, is such a blessing and an honor to. But but a journey that neither isn't, I knew anything about. Totally. And I, well, you struck on something, isn't like what a lot of people don't realize who don't have them um, or go through uh, the symptoms is like the conversational aspect is for me, I'm so grateful for getting that back because I'm a communicator at heart. And the second that started to go from my abilities, I went into full panic mode. I can deal with the sickness, the physical sickness symptoms and the lethargy and um, lack of motivation, you know, those things hit me hard and it was painful to have people watch that um, with me because I was such a driven person and, um, but I could always push through workouts with sickness and I just did it and it wasn't safe, but I just pushed through everything. But it was when I started to not be able to carry a conversation and you know, you know how it is. Like I would be just mm -hmm. 20 minutes in and then I would just go, what, what were we talking about? Like, what was this whole conversation? Yes. I'd forget people's names I've known for 15, 20 years and just couldn't pull anything. And I consider myself a, an intelligent and articulate person. And um, it was like, everything was just gone and I was searching. And so I, went, I became kind of a recluse for mm -hmm. many months because I was afraid to even like partake in normal conversations and I kind of dumbed myself down so that we wouldn't be able to talk about things that I couldn't pull from anymore and that I started getting tests on my brain because I was like there's got to be something up here and then it's the disappointment of hearing like you're perfectly healthy oh, <laughs> didn't we hear and that I'm like oh, I'm going time. crazy yeah, I'm going I thought me? I'm going crazy yeah I, I, I don't know how your family what was with that like I had a um, maybe not so ideal situation, the relationship I was in at the time, he did, we knew nothing about the illness, obviously, at that time, but he just did not know how to support me in that. And his, his thoughts were like, there's got to be something I got to be able to fix this. And when he couldn't, he really pulled away from me and was just like, you're not the person I fell in love with. I don't and just that was it. And it was yeah. so destroying to like my yeah. psyche, because I'm like, I know I'm not, but I don't even know where to go in this. Oh, Tamara, I have to tell you, I have a great husband. We've been married 30 years and we've been through a lot together, right? But this was the icing and the cake. And I'm going to share this just, yeah. a quick little story, just yeah. a few minute story that I've never shared with anybody else. So you're the first person to hear this outside of my husband. 
but I was in chronic pain a lot of times. You know, they diagnosed me with fibromyalgia and I could not sleep. He had insomnia, serious insomnia. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, took an edible one night mm -hmm. um, and I'd never done that before. And I don't know what happened, but I was allergic to a lot of things, okay? Um, and so I took the edible and it gave me kind of a, 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 a an adverse reaction. I started oh, yeah. to hallucinate. Karen, yeah. Nope. Yeah. And, on and, edibles yeah. Too. <laughs> and um, I was shouting at my husband to shoot me. Shoot me, get it over with. I'm so done with it. I don't want this anymore. And the next day he, he, I mean, it was a horrific event. Yeah. I can't even share with you how, what a horror story it was. It was an out of body experience. And the next day he sat down with me. What, he was such a sweetheart. And he sat down and he had his pad of paper and he said, okay, sweetheart, what have we done? What has worked? What hasn't worked? And what haven't we looked at anymore? Because I will never have a night like that again. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, I, and so just those types of situations, yeah. I look back and go, Oh, thank goodness I had that support system at that time, but it was really hard. It was really hard because he was like my wife that has always been this type A top performer, always out there is falling apart in front of my eyes. That's what I talk to women about a lot is that this tears people apart because the it's not just being sick. A lot of men or uh, your partner, your family, they know how to support you when you're physically ill. Mm -hmm. It's all the other stuff it does to mm -hmm. your psyche and, and, and just being told we're okay, but knowing you're not what that starts to gaslight you almost. So you become this version of yourself that you don't even recognize. So inadvertently you, you push people away that should be there for you. And so the, I talked to many women that their relationships completely fall apart after years yeah. and it's devastating to me because I'm like it's not I don't want to necessarily necessarily say that the person was a bad person it just is so difficult to support someone in a time Absolutely. when like someone has cancer they're like I can sit with you through cancer we can do this this is the game plan we know how long we, there's no rule book for this there's no formula and you're in this space where everything's the unknown and you're asking someone please stand with me in this unknown space and thank god you did have him and that he was able to stand strong and be like i know there's something wrong here but some can't and that was the true test for me about who i wanted in my life and mm -hmm. and what i wouldn't stand for in the future but i don't blame him for not being able to stand with me because i know I had to walk this journey by myself. That was my own path. But when I talk to women about it, I say, give them some grace because it's really difficult to uh, see your loved one hurting and not be able to be that fixer, to be mm -hmm. there for them in the way that they can because you're, it's really, um, I say the journey is your own, but you're not alone. So like everyone's looks so different. Um, and even as women ask, like, how did you do with this? And how did you, you know, like, it all depends on your, your symptoms, who's around you, what your life circumstances are, but just know that you have this amazing support system. Now you had it done in October. There was already, you know, the Facebook group, I'm sure you were a part of, um, and a big growing online community. When I found out about it, the Facebook group was at about just hit 60,000, mm -hmm. but it was like the, I needed even if there was five people in there, I needed to see yeah. someone else going through it. That was the changing factor for me. So it's the first thing I tell women to go to. I'm like, I'm so glad you found me, but here's this wealth of research and knowledge and just input from other women. And that's how this thing has dominoed is other women like you being so willing to be vulnerable about it because we can't pretend like these type of intricate and, and intimate stories aren't happening to us because then you're just letting the next girl down by not revealing all the stuff it did to you. you know? Yeah, exactly. And I was on my knees one night and I said, if you will help me put the pieces together of what is going on, I promise you, I will be a voice. I promise okay. you, I will pay it forward. Ooh, chilies. Um, that was the same prayer I made on my knees 
And then honestly, the next day, I don't know many people who know this story. I had a best friend in Australia who was going through breast cancer at 28 years old. And she was like, babe, your symptoms sound so much like mine, but I know you've been tested for it. I don't, I don't know what I can tell you. And she told me about the medical medium. I don't know if you've heard. Yes. Oh yes. He, yeah. yeah. So I started, I went on Anthony Williams page and it was as if like, the heavens opened up and the one post I saw on his page was a girl just saying how her breast implants were doing this to her. And it was the first time I'd even like remotely put that and that together. Like it wouldn't have even, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen one person talk about it in my life. And, and that was um, January of 2019. And then from her page, it was just like this effect of, of seeing yeah her detox and then someone else's that led me to the Facebook group, led me to BIIAware.com. And then it was like, you know, down the rabbit hole, just. Oh, well, I was consumed for many, many days. Like that's yeah. all I did. And then they were out within, as soon as I could find a doctor within three weeks. So You're I was like, I needed the sign. Mine was 12 days. And I said the Red Sea part yeah. because okay. nobody yep. gets them out in 12 days. Right. Yep. Nobody. Oh, I didn't, I didn't think I would, I knew I made the decision. I said, you know, I'd done the same thing. Like, God, if this is what I need to do, like just guide me. And I'd been through nine plastic surgeons who were just like, it was, I, I call it like a re-victimization. Mm -hmm. um, it was horrible. The people that I came across and I'll say men, unfortunately, they were all men doctors, but it was like, you know, they, Touch, you're already in a very vulnerable space mm -hmm. of wanting them out, knowing what they've done to you, really not feeling like they're a part of you anymore. And then you're just getting kind of like groped and handled. And they're like, well, I think you could get them out. We could go bigger. We could change the shape. We'd, they're a lot more safer if we choose these ones. And I'm literally in there being like, I want them out. Take them out. Can you do it? I don't think you're going to want that. You'll be deformed. No one's going to yeah. love you. The things I heard, I was just like, oh, this is not for me. Like nine, nine down. I think I'm just going to call it a day. And my dad had come to me and he knew my struggle and was like, I have a patient. He's been a doc. He's been a client of mine for, he's a chiropractor. He's been a client of mine for a couple of years. He always has a neck issue. He's a plastic surgeon. I know you're over the search, but just give him like, give him a shot. He's a great guy. And his assistant called me in the morning, 8 a.m. the next morning and said, I can see you at 8.30 if you can get here. And we booked it a week later, even though I had pneumonia and they weren't going to put me under. And I just prayed on it and was like, please yeah. God, if I can go under, this will be what changes me. And I, I woke up from surgery, looked at him and was like, you changed my life. And yeah. he hasn't put in an implant since. He's an implant-free doctor now. Wow. Wow. That, my friend, is divine intervention. Shout out to Dr. Spivak because he was like, I will not be leaving that legacy for my daughters. And like, that's, Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing. So there are good doctors out there. It takes a search. You know, I try to tell women it's like kind of maybe not going to hit out the park on the first one, but go into it knowing what you want out of it mm -hmm. and don't be swayed to like get different ones or that's something they're going to say just because they're the professional is going to make it any different. Most of them are guided towards the money and most of them are in still this belief that they are safe enough. Yeah. Yeah. In. You know, I liken it to my own denial because I had been told a couple of times over the course of my health crisis have you considered your breast implants? And I wasn't ready to hear it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if that is your livelihood, maybe they're just not ready to hear it yet, right? Totally. But I'm hoping that with as many voices that are coming forward, you know, this has been around for a very long time, but the voices were re really small. There was only yeah. a few of them. And we're growing and growing and growing in numbers and we're getting noisy, right? Mm -hmm. um, that eventually the doctors can't. Right deny that there is a correlation. Mm -hmm. And so that's my hope is that at least women are given this information up front and they can make their educated yeah. decision as to whether or not this works for them. But you know, your big platform going through this whole thing, you've been able to get to a place of emotionally healing and mentally healing mm -hmm. and paying that forward and helping women to learn to 
self-care, yeah. you know, love themselves just the way they are. And I know there was a journey with that too. Can you share okay. that a little bit with us? <laughs> yeah, that was towards the tail end of it. That was my kind of place I didn't really want to look at at first. I, I knew that was going to be a rough one for me because what I kept coming back to in my healing journey was, Tamara, you haven't done the psychological and mental work that it's going to take to, to carry this healing onward. Like you can physically heal your body. I can learn to love small boobies again. They didn't make me. I understood that I had gotten to that place and it does help. You know, people look at my platform like, oh, well, it helps because you have this attribute or this, that, but you have to remember like the whole thing was my business. It was mm -hmm. my Tamara that I wanted to present to the world. Mm -hmm. And by undoing all that, it also unearthed all these hidden traumas I didn't know that I had. Well, I knew, but I never really wanted to work on them. I'll be really honest with you. I was selectively vulnerable about what I shared with people on my journey. And this really forced me to go, you know what, if you want to walk, you want to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. So I spent the last year unprocessing all the shit I never worked on prior to getting them. <laughs> And that was the part that I thought, if I can just teach women this aspect, it will save them from ever even having to go down the route of getting implants or changing or altering themselves in that way. And I will not stop 100% of women and I won't stop a majority of women because it, it's ingrained in us to always want to better ourselves or do, do more, be more. And with that, cosmetic surgery is just part of our environment. But if I can start the conversation with women about what it is you are fixing by altering something of your physicality, and can we get to the root of why you're doing that and what could be a better solution long term, because we're all going to age, we're all going to change. And, and it's that denial of that ultimate time being something that happens to all of us and aging being something that happens to all of us that we don't understand that now these girls are going to be so disillusioned with themselves by the time they hit 30, 40, 50, 60, because they're just been used, used to being able to just fix it and alter it. And then I'll feel better about myself. But I had to do the deep work of healing those traumas that said I wasn't good enough. So I need to do this to just make, give myself that little bit of edge or because I can't stand on my own two feet as myself, you know, but that all came from a lot of stuff I had to bring to the surface. That was not pretty. It was not cute. It was the work that just um, was personal. It was something that not everyone can do. I urged them to do it, but I needed support. I had therapy. I had um, a best friend. I had some family rally around me. Um, I went into dark places that I knew I had to bring to light if I was going to really nip this for the long term. And I knew I had to because I also, like you, I got called to be the voice. And I said, if I have this platform, I knew it was never for what I won't say everyone else, but for what people thought it was going to be for, or thought I was using it for. I always knew it had this underlining, I want to connect with people on a deeper level. I just didn't know it was going to be through boobs, you know, um, <laughs> through finding yourself through that. But I think that's the like glory of the journey and of social media and how we can really utilize it to better each other and better ourselves in an authentic way. And it really is possible if it's not driven by um, this idea that we have to somehow like make money off of it or um to, it it can be used to really connect us in a very disconnected society so and like you said I just never knew I would be talking to people about boobs so much but for me it's so much deeper than just the boobs like they were the catalyst to me becoming the Tamara that I am now and hopefully the Tamara I can't wait to see what I'm going to be in 10 years because what this has changed the trajectory of my life so much in such a beautiful way that um, 
I'd almost say like, I wish it would have happened to me sooner, but it's just, um, it was the perfect timing for finding it out, for being the voice um, for hopefully a generation of women um, to even stop them from getting them in in the first place. I think that was something that I was totally shocked at um, when I put out the video was like, it wasn't just women coming out being like, oh my God, I never knew, like, I'm going to go check online and thank you so much. It was also the girls that were in, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 had their appointments booked and then were just like, I'm not going to do that. Like, and I was just, there's something here to like really utilizing my voice and I'm not going to save them all. And I'm not putting that pressure on myself because it's not my duty. But Mm -hmm. as long as I have the platform, as long as I have the testimony, I will continue to be as vocal about it as possible. And you know, at some point we don't ever want to like just live in the trauma. Like I'd love to move on from it, but I also feel like we have a lot to do within this um, space. It's a, as you know, like multi-billion dollar industry that I would love to unravel from the inside out. And I think it's not just about going after the implant companies and telling them to like take advantage, take, um, responsibility because that's been done since the nineties and they've covered it up. They have so much money. How I look at how you can unravel the system is if you infiltrate the brains of women at a younger age, or even just women across the board, if you can start changing the way that they think about themselves and how they move through the world, well, then you've just changed the course of what they're going to put their money into, where they're going to invest their time and their energy into. And it's hopefully not going to be in something that's selling false promises and we know, like, we know, like, we're the strongest consumers in the world. So if you yeah. shut down a whole industry because women aren't buying it anymore, it's just like if we saw buying makeup, the whole industry would crash. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, you know, look, baby yeah. steps over here. Look, baby yeah. steps. <laughs> I love that you talk about what an opportunity this gave you because I've said this before and I'll say it again: our darkest, our greatest gifts sometimes come in our darkest hours, right? Mm, the 100%. To really look the monster in the eyes. And what's interesting, the story I just exp- explained to you or, or just told you about that dark and, and dreary yeah. night, that unraveled a piece that I need to look at. Mm-hmm. My, my husband said, You know what? Have you, I, I really feel like the trauma from your teenage years you really haven't looked at. Have you considered that that might be a piece to this puzzle? Which led me to a week long retreat. Yeah, which led me to a week long retreat that, by the way, I'm going to throw this out there. If anybody has ever gone through sexual abuse before they're 18, the unique retreat puts on a thing called Haven Retreat. It's free. It is free. And they will take, you will put that link in here because I never will. It's and and that's something I had to dig deep in. Yes. What a great opportunity. I probably would have never addressed it had I not had the opportunity to go that dark and to have a partner that said, hey, would you look at this and maybe consider that this is a piece to the puzzle? So those of you that are out there that are going through this health crisis, is it a possibility that you could also have and use this time to Mm -hmm. heal emotionally, to heal mentally, to heal in all areas of your life so that you actually can truly become the best version of yourself. And I love that your platform is all about this because it's more than just what we look like, right? It, I mean, the fact that you said that, it just hit the nail on the head of why I do this because I can talk about boobs all day long and I think that it's the gateway to the real conversation that I want to have with women, but it's that I had unresolved traumas. I had sexual traumas. I had mental abuse. And I think that um, when that is unresolved and when that doesn't ever surface, well, it's surfacing whether we know it or not, but when you don't ever consciously look at it, um, it's going to affect you for the rest of your life. So whether you're physically sick from your implants or you make a poor decision due to self-sabotage or letting the wrong people into your life, it's going to affect you negatively in some way. So like that's why I say, rests were an opportunity to unravel the stuff I had been shoving so far down and saying, look at all this good stuff in my life. See, I'm working on all my shit. I'm doing good stuff. You don't, don't, don't come any closer. I don't want you to see all the other stuff and I don't want to have to work on it. 
but it didn't allow me to. And so that's why I talk about it because even if you haven't gone through what we've gone through, there is a moment that you can shift and say, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to look at that dark stuff. And I just want women to know like that darkness isn't, that isn't going to kill you. You're killing yourself every day by allowing all this to affect you and to continue to put yourself last because you don't want to look at it. And we just, we live in a society that's really afraid of the dark. And I, I was the prime example of it. I just mm-hmm. put on a show and they don't have, and you know, work harder, be a hustler, grind, like be accomplished. All these things can make it so they don't look at your, your darkness, but we have a really amazing, like just moment in time right now. I think that people really want to heal. And, um, if you're ready for it, the, the answers will come to you. You just got to be ready to dive in and say like, surrender and i and i do believe surrendering is the biggest thing to this this the biggest piece of this puzzle and it just so happens we were gifted it Mm -hmm. through our journey um some people have to literally force themselves into a surrender um position but um i do say like to me it's an opportunity because i know how hard-headed and stubborn i was and i'm a leo and i'm driven and type a and so to get us to be on your knees and surrender is like some people are forced into it and some people have to like um, bravely take that step and I'm still working on how to get people to get to that place without something shocking happening to them um I still I think there is a way and I think it takes someone really brave to just say I'm going to throw in the towel on what I've been doing it hasn't been working let's, let's try something different um, and I, I commend any woman or man trying to take that journey to say, like, this is me. This is all my crap. I just want to mm-hmm. bring it up and work through it. And it's it unravels your whole existence. And it's not easy to live in our society where you have to work so hard just to survive. And now you're trying to get to a place to like, things you need. But that comes to a place where you also realize like the things that are, are important and aren't important and where you want to spend your time, where you want to spend your money, where you want to like cut things out so that you can, like I dove head first into mentally, emotionally and spiritually healing for a year. It's a blessing that I was able to do that. But I also put the things that I thought I wanted on the back burner, you know, mm-hmm. sold yeah. my car, move into my dad's house, did the work. You know, in a society that would usually be like, what's going on with her? Like, seems to be something happening over there. I don't really want to be a part of it. A lot of people left my life. And that's just such a a tell for like, I'm doing the work that really matters. Yeah. And that was hard. That was really hard to have but people. You were purging leave. those individuals that weren't serving you anyways, right? Yeah. So that's also something that I think more people um, should do is the purge. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. It's and that's scary. Is. And that's, uh-huh. that is really deep work as well. So, yeah. you know, in, in kind of closing this conversation, which has been just so beautiful and so helpful. And I believe that this is going to be a powerful episode for so many women out oh, yeah. there. Um, is there any final thought any final piece of advice, golden nugget that you want to share as we wrap this up? Um, wow. Yeah. So I feel like when you're looking at your life and, and this is specifically for women going through this, that, that hear this message. Um, I know how scary it can be the unknown, you know, of what am I going to look like? What's my life going to be like? I I don't know if I have the strength to work on all this while trying to hold down my life and maybe a family and all this. It gets better. Mm -hmm. It might be really shitty for a little while, but it's not something you can't handle. And it's not something we weren't cut out to be able to do. We've been through far worse in the years that we've suffered through this. There is light at the end of this. And it's glorious and you're glorious in your natural self and in whatever you're left with physically, 
it's you and like your story is going to be the most powerful thing. And so like, I urge you to look at like the legacy that you're leaving here on this planet and who you were called to be, even if it's on a, on a small scale in your community, in your house, that what you're teaching your young kids, it's like, you're getting back to your truest self, how we were you know, created to be. And there's nothing more powerful and beautiful than that. Wow. Wow. It's my turn to have chills and <laughs> a little emotional there because it's absolutely true. Thank you so much for you. your powerful message. Um, you're a force to be reckoned with you. and you are just a light in this world. Thank um, you so, much. so with that being said, thank you again for sharing this time. Keep doing this work. We need more of you. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, thank you for listening listeners out there and sharing this time with us as we unravel breast implant illness. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Spread the word by subscribing, liking, and sharing the Killer Boobies podcast today. You could be the person who helps someone reverse their pain and suffering and reclaim their health today.